gospel reading today comes from the Gospel of Mark, chapter 1, verses 4 through 11. It can be found on the second half of your pew Bible on page 34. So listen to a word from God. John the baptizer appeared in the wilderness, proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And people from the whole Judean countryside and all the people of Jerusalem were going out to him and were baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. Now John was clothed with camel's hair and with a leather belt around his waist, and he ate locusts and wild honey. He proclaimed, the one who is more powerful than I is coming after me. I am not worthy to stoop down and untie the thong of his sandals. I have baptized you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. In those days, Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. And just as he was coming up out of the water, he saw the heavens torn apart and the spirit descending like a dove on him. And a voice came from heaven. You are my son, the beloved. With you, I am well pleased. The gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Christ. So as I was preparing for this sermon and reading these stories, I realized something. I'm not very creative. <laughs> my roommate, uh, one of my roommates, he is a guitar player. He's a musician. He like, has a band and has, they have an album, and now he's working on his solo work. Um, and it just really amazes me, like the way he's able to write new songs and come up with something Um, You can't really give me a piece of paper and expect me to come up with something artistic or beautiful or inspiring. It's not my gig. I'll never make money from doing that. Um, I like to think that I can, but (laughs) um, usually it's just not very pretty. But that's okay. Um, I've always been really drawn to artistry and to creativity and imagination. Um, And part of that, I think, is why I'm so drawn to the stories in Genesis 1, um, to this poem this beautiful retelling of the creation of the world. Um, And so I want to highlight a few of the kind of funny things that I noticed as I read through um, Genesis 1. Um, The first thing is that phrase that we read in the beginning when God created, it can actually be translated in like 12 different ways. Um, And they're all kind of different. They emphasize different parts. Um, And one that I came across that was kind of interesting is in the beginning of God's creation, or in the beginning of God's creating. Um, It emphasized that creation is a process. It's not a snap your fingers, a one and done. Um, It's not something that is just like whimsical. It's something that requires energy and thought and time. Um, And another phrase that was kind of funny as I read through Genesis 1 was that phrase formless void. It says the spirit of God is over the waters looking out at this formless void One scholar said that the nearest to English that that phrase could be would actually be topsy-turvy. And so you have the spirit of God looking out at this topsy-turvy, chaotic place, and it kind of reminded me of the youth room on any given Sunday after we've been in there. Um, Just kidding. But um, so you have the spirit of God. The Ruach Elohim is a feminine spirit of God, and she's looking out over these waters Uh, And then something beautiful happens. Uh, It takes time, seven days according to this poem. um, And she is creating, she's taking things that weren't there and putting them there. And then she's also reordering. Um, God is taking things, putting them in their place. Um, It's not just a woof, right? It's not just a poof and everything is there. It's this process. It's this timely process. Um, And as I read that, I thought, that's really cool, but why is that coupled with the baptism of Jesus? What does Jesus being plunged under the water and then named and claimed have to do with the creation of the world? I didn't see a lot of parallels at first, um, but as I read through Mark 1, um, some things kind of came to mind. It says that John the baptizer was in the wilderness, Um, I kind of liken that to that formless void, that topsy-turviness. John the Baptist wasn't in the city. He wasn't in the temple. He didn't have the blessings of the religious elite of his time. He was away from society, away from government, out here kind of in his own world. 
Um, and he's preaching and he's teaching and he's saying these funny things. And the weird thing is that people are listening and that they're going out to him to be baptized by him to hear what he had to say. And then Jesus shows up, steps into the River Jordan, is baptized, and the Spirit of God, much like in Genesis 1, sweeps over the waters in form of a dove and rests on God's shoulders, on Jesus' shoulders. And God names and claims Jesus as God's own. And I imagine what the people on the bank were thinking, or what maybe the Spirit or Jesus were thinking as they looked out at the bank at this group of people. It was probably a little chaotic. Um, I doubt that the people in this crowd were really rich, were really um, highly regarded in the societal structure of the time. Um, and I wonder, why did they go out there? Why was that so moving for them? Why was hearing this kind of crazy sounding preacher out in the wilderness, why did that bring so many people out there? And I think it has to do with the message of John and then the following message of Jesus. Jesus is said just a few verses after what we read. He says, the time is fulfilled. The kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe in the good news. So in that, there's this promise, right, that Jesus is going to bring this new creation, this new earth, this kingdom on earth. And why that was so enticing to these people may have been because there wasn't this super rigorous um, structural way of being a part of this kingdom. Um, see, in that day, for Hebrew people to receive forgiveness, they would have to sacrifice in the temple. And it wasn't a one-and-done sacrifice. It was a societal, structural, um, repetitive process. Over and over again, they're going to the temple and they're sacrificing a lamb, a turtle dove, something, right? Um, and that is how they would receive this forgiveness. But here is this preacher out in the wilderness just saying, repent, just repent, just be um, sorry and turn away from what you've done. And then... Be baptized, be forgiven, and let that be your new reality, your new creation, the new world that you can live in. Um, and as Jesus is ushering in this kingdom of God, I, I really start to see these parallels between Genesis 1 and between Mark 1. You have the spirit brooding over the waters, looking out at a formless void and imagining what it could be. And here we are 2,000 years later, Still going, <laughs> right? Still kicking. <laughs> We're still alive and well. We're sending out people to share this living water and the promises of God with other people. Um, and sometimes I think, what could this place be? What could this kingdom of God be? What is it like? It certainly wasn't with a ruler who um, was underpinning everyone there. Uh, it was a ruler that gave respect. We have a ruler, a king, a messiah, that says he came to earth not to be served, but to serve and to be of service to us. And in this new creation, this new kingdom, it's so unlike anything that the Hebrew people had ever experienced or seen. It's unlike anything that we 21st century Christians could have ever created on our own. This new kingdom isn't limited by human creativity, thankfully, um, but is driven forward by the thought and imagination of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. The invitation to join the Spirit in these waters, in this baptism, is open to all people. There certainly wasn't a 14-article statement of faith that the people on the shore had to sign before they could come into the waters and receive this forgiveness. The kingdom of God has no borders. It is a radical place that is ever expanding and seeking to share its gifts with the world. The kingdom of God is a place where the cares of the poor, the cares of the hungry, of the thirsty, the outcast, the downtrodden, those cares are first and foremost. And the keys to this kingdom have been entrusted to us. We are tasked to continue envisioning, building, and structuring Thankfully, we are not expected to work alone. We have each other, 
course, and we have a promise that God is with us, even to the end of the age. Amen. Amen.